Please help me in welcoming Ms. El Bashir. Good evening, everyone. Um, I want to thank the World Affairs Council for inviting me here today, and it's an honor to be with you all today, this evening. All right, so um, we're going to actually start off the conversation uh, with a little bit of an intro about the Arab American National Museum. I heard a couple of uh, whispers and talks about the museum. So first, I'd like to know, how many of you have ever visited the museum, which is in Dearborn? All right, a few. Um, not a problem, but this is where it all started off. All right, so in order to even start talking about Khalid al Bay and his impact, we need to talk about the museum and what we aim to serve. The Arab American National Museum, and I'll refer to it as the AM from this point on, is the first and only museum in the United States devoted to Arab American history and culture. Um, we grew out of the largest Arab American service provider in Michigan, Access, um, service provider in the US, um, Access in 2005, and we're also a Smithsonian affiliate. We are committed to not only dispelling the misconceptions about Arab Americans and other minorities, but to bring, also bringing the voices of Arab Americans to mainstream America. So this is really uh, the vision and what we aim to do. And our mission is quite simple. It is to document, preserve, and present the history, contributions, and culture of Arab Americans. And I want to show you a short video, for those of you who haven't, as a little teaser, um, of our museum. Now, Ishmael, earlier you were talking about um, the Arab American Museum. That's a place I'd really like to check out. It's one of my favorite places, and look, we're here right now. Oh, it's almost like we planned it. <laughs> <laughs> Inside, we met up with Devin Ackman, the deputy director of the museum. Well, the Arab American National Museum is the first and only museum of its kind in the nation. There's 17,500 museums. We're the only one telling the Arab American experience. Um, having said that, uh, we're an ethno-specific museum, not an ethnocentric museum. So while we're trying to tell the story of Arab Americans, we're actually celebrating the diversity of our country. This gallery here tells the stories of a lot of prominent Arab Americans who have made major contributions to American life. Yeah, watching the screens behind us, I had no idea that there's so many people that have done so much in America were Arab Americans. Yeah, there's numerous stories. Everything from uh, Ralph Nader to Kathy Najimy, Krista McAuliffe, the teacher on The Challenger. Yeah, uh, I had no numerous. idea. Yeah, yeah. So come on inside and we can take a look at oh, some of this. Cool. cool. So what's in the cabinet? Sure, so many of our exhibits here at the museum are hands-on and interactive. These are particular exhibits known as Did You Know? And in this instance here, uh, this is about Robert George. He served under seven administrations, 50 years in the White House. What do you think his job was? Seven presidents? Seven presidents. 50 years, he was the advisor to the president's advisor's advisor. Hmm, well, why don't you hit that button and we'll find out. Oh, God. Oh my gosh, he was Santa Claus? Yeah, the official White House Santa Claus. For seven presidents? Seven presidents. That's fascinating. He's not actually in here, is he? No, unfortunately, oh. he's not. I really enjoyed touring the Arab American Museum with Devin, and I would highly recommend you check it out. It's a beautiful place, and there are eye-opening exhibits around every corner. Under the Radar Michigan is brought to you in part by the Michigan State Housing and Development Authority. All right. Now, of course, it's important to understand the relevance of Khalid's work, being an Arab artist, um, to the museum. Because one thing we always make sure to emphasize is that we always highlight the diaspora. We talk about Arab Americans and not so much what's happening in the Arab world or in the Middle East. We talk about the diaspora. So that's what we aim to do. So many times folks think, all right, well, Khalid al Bay is an artist who's living in Doha from Sudan. He's an artist from the Arab world, from the Middle East what brought him to your museum. And so this map right here, and we do have copies upstairs um, for those of you who are interested. And I'm going to give you a very brief history lesson, and we can open it up for discussion at the end. I don't want to spend so much time on this. But as you can see, the different shades of orange, these are th highlighting the 22 Arab countries. Now, we say Arab countries not to make it seem like Arabs are an extraterrestrial you know, group. Um, but we purposely state Arab countries instead of the Middle East, because the Middle East alienates those countries that are non-Middle Eastern and also includes countries that are non-Arab. And so as you're looking at this map, you'll see that there are 12 countries in North Africa and 12 in Western Asia. 
All right. Of these 12 Arab countries, um, 22 Arab countries, there are three unifying factors. Basically, what makes a country Arab, which then trickles down to what makes an individual Arab American or just Arab. And so, when you're looking at this, keep in mind, and I'm usually I play a guessing game, but we don't have much time for that. So, the first unifying factor is linguistics, Arabic. Arabic is spoken in all 21 Arab countries, and I say 21 out of the 22 because Somalia is the only country in which their official language is not Arabic. It's a primary language, not an official. So every other country, their official language is Arabic. That means it's taught in the schools, it's the language of the media, language of the government. The second is that there's a shared sense of culture and heritage. Now, I don't want you to walk away thinking that Arabs are a monolith. All right, there's a lot of diversity that exists within these countries. Diversity stemming from language, from religion, from dialect, from ethnicities. Very, very uh, diverse within and outside of, their, outside of these borders. And the third unifying factor is membership in the Arab League, which is modeled after the United Nations. And so that's what unites these um, 22 Arab countries. Now, of course, what you don't see highlighted and is common misconception that usually conflated with Arab is Iran and Turkey. Both these countries are not part of the Arab world. They are non-Arab. Um, they are, you know, they might have, they share proximity to one another. And yes, there might be patterns of cultural practices, just like you'll find in any other country, but they are not part of the Arab world. So if you do visit our museum or come to one of our exhibits or just even one of our talks, those two, three countries, Iran, Turkey, and Israel are not part of that conversation when we talk about Arab Americans. So I hope that makes sense. And we can, again, if you have questions, we can talk about it at the end during the Q&A session. So I first discovered, and I'll keep this up for a little bit before we go to the next slide. I first discovered Khaled El Bey's work in 2011 through a mutual friend from Grand Valley State, my alma mater, uh, small world. And in 2014, I came across his application to present at our biannual day one conference. It's a forum of the arts at the museum. And so, it was an aha moment for me, and I had an incredible urgency to curate and exhibit his work, um, which is outside of my job purview, because I'm not tasked with curating exhibits, but rather public programs and educational initiatives. And I am an, a Sudanese American, so I felt also a bit more involved with his work because it also spoke to me and my background and my family history and just our diasporic community. Uh, thankfully, I was able to garner the financial support from the Sudanese American Medical Association's Michigan chapter, which helped to solidify our plans for his exhibition. So, I'm sure many of you are asking, who is this person? Um, who is Khalid El Bey? He is a Romanian-born Sudanese po artist, political cartoonist and illustrator, living in Doha, Qatar. He's sort of like the United Nations. His stark political, uh, politically charged images rose to prominence on social media during the early stages of the Arab Spring in 2011 and have become a symbol of the uprisings. All right? He's sort of the artist of the revolution. Um, his images became so iconic. His work is shared and is still being shared by revolutionary groups and political activists in his native country, Sudan, as well as in Yemen, Tunisia, Syria. It's been stenciled on walls in Beirut and in Egypt. Um, and so what I think the best thing for us to do is to also um, honor him, is to listen to a few, you know, two minutes of his your time uh, from the artist himself before we delve into his artwork. Did I do that? I don't think so. Oh, okay, so one moment. I don't know if cartoons can change the world, but we can certainly try. My cartoons were used by activists and graffiti artists. One of my cartoons was before the fall of Mubarak, and it was actually graffitied in Lebanon, and it was about Mubarak, and it was graffitied in Egypt. And uh, in Yemen, some people used my cartoon in banners. It's really been hard watching what happened during these five years because everybody had that hope that finally a change will happen. The whole circle came back and you know, the, you know, things are still the same. Most of my friends are either left the countries or in jail.
I was arrested in Egypt uh, and interrogated for a couple of hours, actually asking me if I'm going to draw. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to draw. <laughs> not if you don't want me to, I'm not going to draw anything. It's nice to see that they're scared of us now. It gives us more power, it gives us more confidence in what we're doing, that we're actually doing something right. You shouldn't say, everybody is a savage because they don't agree with us, right? If you, just we Charlie, and if not, then you're a savage. For me, this is an opportunity to reach out to the other side. Because basically, we see what, what the West thinks of us, but they don't see what we think of them. Great. So as you can see, Khaled has and continues to challenge governments, uh, both in the Middle East, the Muslim world, the West, and stereotypes with his political cartoons, and his impact continues to flourish. I mean, he has garnered so much support um, in news media. If you look at his, and he says this, and starting off in 2011 with one image, um, started off with 200 likes, and then within a couple of weeks went up to 60,000 likes. So the fact that his artwork resonated so much with folks in social media, and that means most of them are youth, says a lot. Um, his work speaks to the power of social media and the public debate. I will not be interpreting each of the images that you'll be seeing, um, or uh, for mo most part, because I want to uphold Khalid's practice of allowing the viewer, the viewer to use their own lens to interpret the imagery. All right, so. Whether or not you're well-versed in Middle Eastern politics or not, you'll be able to understand a lot of this because he also incorporates um, popular culture. And so a lot of it will resonate. Um, and if not, again, we can br uh, open it up to discussion, but I won't speculate too much on the artist's work. So the Sp Arab Spring, how he came to prominence. The first image that you see, the rest will follow, is the title was Khalid's first cartoon that responded to the Arab Spring. This is the one that went from 200 likes to 60,000 on Facebook. It was widely and positively received, and it was because of the first uprising in the Arab Spring, which was with Tunis. That's the finger that you see. Um, and so followed by the rest of the other North African countries that he was hoping would follow suit. The next few are in direct response to Syria, Libya, and Egypt's uprisings. Um, and again, as you can see, Khalid p uses popular imagery and popular cultural references in his work. For example, this shows Bashar al-Assad of Syria um, in the famous banner, the hit TV show, Mad Men. I'm sure this resonated. He purposely uses popular cultural references to keep viewers engaged and to effectively deliver his message. His philosophy is you only have like what, five seconds of someone's attention span when they're on, the, on their phones. So if it doesn't click right away, then it's not effective. Pac-Man. This is again was also in direct response to the uh, journalists who were arrested during uh, Sisi of Egypt. And you can see sort of the story of Egypt, hopefully you guys can see that. In Libya, breaking Gaddafi. This one right here was um, directly in response to what took place in 2011 with a one of the most renowned Arab cartoonists, Ali Farzat, who's from Syria. He was attacked in Damascus, um, again in 2011, because of his work, and the attackers primarily focused on his hands to send a message. So Khalid drew this in response to the attacks. And Ali Farzat is also the, um, the, the direct, not director, but he's also like the president of the Arab Cartoonist Association. So he's a well-renowned and um, figure in the Arab world. So this was a very um, atrocious act 
not because he was just an innocent man, but because the message that they were trying to send to censor him. Khalid discusses the heartache that came with the aftermath of the uprisings, how the flames have been extinguished. However, he is hopeful, and he illustrates this through a number of cartoons where he's hoping to give rebirth to the idea of revolution. Just because the uprisings didn't go as we all hoped doesn't mean that the idea should perish. In Al Jazeera article that Khalid authored, he writes, it's no easy feat to come up with a cartoon that can pass all levels of censorship starting with self-censorship, then government-imposed coronership, which in many countries in this region is actually somebody's job, to pick apart and find potentially offensive meaning. And he says, as an Arab and Muslim political cartoonist, living and working in the Middle East, the fear of upsetting the wrong people is part of daily life. So Sudanese politics, and this is absolutely important because, again, it speaks to his identity. In the following series, Khalid displays his heartache over the breakup of Sudan and South Sudan in 2011, as well as creatively and poignantly at capturing the internal political strife ranging from tribalism, racism, political affiliation, etc. So in this series, you'll see, again, the sort of um, his, his feelings about the, the breakup. Now, you know, we have a very large South Sudanese community in uh, Grand Rapids. So I'm sure if many of you, either through the church or through the classroom, have heard to some degree about the South Sudan secession. Again, this is the, the fear of what could happen with Sudan, starting from the right. Now he shifts his lenses to America. In the next series, Khalid shifts the lens away from the Arab world and Muslim world to the United States for a number of excellent reasons. He focuses on the double standards and hypocrisies and, well, the realities of our social platform that sends shockwaves throughout the world. And it's meant to be thought-provoking, it's controversial, it's polemic. It's not always going to sit well with everyone, but that's the role of a political cartoon, is to push the buttons and to make a point. It's very creative. In this final section, Khalid once again conveys a number of moving, thought-provoking, and interpretive cartoons. Although simple in design, his work is highly interpretive and open-ended. This is very new. This just actually uploaded today. And um, it's titled, From ISIS to Europe, The Refugee Crisis. Khalid critiques much of mainstream rhetoric, and you will see so much of that in the exhibit outside, upstairs actually. Khalid also writes, Muslims seem to lose either way. They are constantly asked to apologize for crimes they never committed, nor supported. They too are victims of the violence of extremists. Still, they are asked to apologize and somehow atone for these crimes that were committed in the name of their religion. Then they must face the wrath of extremists who attack them for refusing to approve the methods they view as the only way to defend Islam. He republished this after the attacks in Texas to show the role of fundamentalism and how it can just sort of engulf an individual. And this one right here was probably one of the most famous and also the most popular at our museum when we had his exhibit. It resonated with youth, um, especially Muslim Americans. And not all Arab Americans are Muslims, but we had a, a large um, 
influx of Muslims who are coming to visit us during this time. And it just kind of highlights the existential crisis that many Muslims around the world, not just Americans, feel because of what's happening with all the tra traumatic events that are taking place and the, the attention that's just now focused on Muslims regardless of how you practice, of having to always justify your religion and your position within your religion. We can play this video. The video is inspired, and this is his quote, the video is inspired by what we have to go through as Arab youth, living with endless socio-political borders and boundaries, and the fight to break them. Obviously, they are very elastic. The figure is in fetus position because we were born free, but we are not free, therefore we are not born yet. And this is his first animation. So at this time, and this is really, I want us to focus a lot more on the Q&A session, but also after going through the, his artwork and seeing the kind of um, responses, the political responses he has. This is very much protest art. It's a, a n I don't want to say new form, but it's definitely a 21st century form of um, protest um, and uh, social activism. And he is in very way not just an artist, but also an activist, very vocal in his in his um, position and his role. And he use, utilizes social media to its fullest extent: Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And this is how you get. In, this is how you engage and and bridge the digital divide um, that tends to separate us. So at this point, what I'd like us to do is um, open up the floors for questions and answers, and I can go back to any images that you'd like. Um, so uh, I know you wanted to moderate. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, so. In order to facilitate Q&A, um, you're welcome to either come down to this mic or this mic. Uh, and you can also text questions to me. Uh, and I believe that number is on the other PowerPoint. Um, so 616-308-6560, and it'll come up on the screen in just a second. So um, we'll give you a chance to think about some of the questions you might have for Ms. Uh, Al-Bashir. I'll start off with just one question. Um, you had mentioned the Arab Cartoonist Association, and I'm just mm -hmm. um, curious how popular uh, political cartoons are in the Arab world and how they might um, function um, as political protests, different or similarly to uh, American political cartoons. Absolutely. They're incredibly popular, and they've been popular for years since before my father was born, they've been popular. It's something that you see, it, despite the fact that there is, yes, censorship and not freedom of expression, there are still medians available for folks to, sh to voice their discontent with their governments, with their society, and so this isn't something new. Um, what's new is that you see the prevalence of, of social media um, helping moving these images um, and cartoons into the hands of folks across the world. And so it's, it's, a, it's always been a common practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First of all, thank you for your talk today. Um, I have a question about um, political cartoons in general. I know that a lot of us have experienced our first um, exposure to political cartoons uh, through our education. Uh, they're found in a lot of textbooks. Mm -hmm. um, it, is it your uh, opinion that um, in the future, when uh, people learn about the Arab Spring, is this going to is, is this uh, body of work going to be one of the um, uh, sort of uh, images or sets of images by which we learn this history, or um, is it going to be something that is? may be considered too challenging or too disruptive to the power structure. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, one, I don't think it's too challenging, because at least with Khaled al-Bay, he, he, he 
aims to make it simple so that it's easy to um, deconstruct and to understand. And I think it's a great way to start to understand what's happening in the Arab world or in the Middle East in general. Um, it's, an, it's an excellent tool for um, empathy and also understanding the political uh, powers that are at play, um, especially because these folks are taking an incredible risk um, with their work. And so I think it's a great way to understand what's happening, but it's not the only tool. I mean, you can't just use cartoons alone. You need to understand history, you need to put it into context, and you need to follow the local news media to also understand what's happening. So it's, it's one of the additional tools needed in your toolkit to understand global politics. say thank you for coming. Um, you brought up the idea of social media. Can you then talk about the role that social media played in the Arab Spring? Um, many of us talk about uh, many of the causes of the Arab Spring, but was social media really a cause or simply a tool that was used on the ground? And how was it then that these kinds of cartoons and satire influenced those dynamics? Mm -hmm. Well, you want to look at one thing. For instance, within the, with the Egyptian revolution, um, information was able to pass from one area to another through social media. So folks who were, let's say, um, in prison or at the, in one of the Tahrir squares, all right, were able to deliver messages across the borders easily. So we were able to understand what was happening without having to rely on local propaganda or local media in general. Um, so that was one thing. It definitely it was a great tool for information sharing. Um, and it gave people the uh, it empowered whoever was holding their smartphone or was able to log into their Facebook without having the government you know, block it to say, this is what's happening and I have images to prove to show the world that this is what we're doing. If it wasn't for social media, I don't, m my opinion, and I'm not a political analyst, I don't believe we would have had the same outlook of or even the images that came out. And we wouldn't have had, we would have known the truth about what was happening on the local and grassroots level. We would have just had the veiled and, um, and the, the lies from the governments that, you know, that were trying to control the, the narrative of what was happening. And so I definitely feel that, and, and I'm not alone in this, that social media was instrumental with the Arab Spring, at least in Egypt. You know, and that helped uh, set the tone for other countries. And again, many folks say that the revolution in Egypt was a revolution of the youth. They're the ones who toppled their government. So what are youth using? I mean, the youth in the United States are no different than the youth in anywhere else where, they, where there's technology. They're communicating with their phones. Um, you look at the United States, for instance, with what's happening with police um, brutality and just folks who are, um, who are unhappy with the government, they're using their social media to leak these images of what's happening. That's increasingly um, replacing um, our trust in local news. If it hasn't leaked and we don't see someone's smartphone, you know, a little shaky video, it, it hasn't, didn't exist in a sense. The satire piece, can you follow up with how satire uh, and social media influenced 9-11, I'm sorry, uh, the Arab Spring? How was satire used by artists and how was it received among those participating in the Arab Spring? So with, in regards to Khalid al-Bay, um, and you can see this even if you go to his Khartoun's page, folks were inspired by it. They saw that someone who was risking their lives to tell the stories was um, utilizing um, you know, this cool concept of art to help motivate. And so you had someone who's 15 years old who let's say doesn't really care about the government, but sees this image and see that it's well liked and it's being shared throughout and then all of a sudden feels like maybe I have a stake in this. So there is an element of that. It's not at the, I don't think it's at the intellectual level of satire as it was maybe in the 50s and 60s if we wanna compare it to the US. Um, but it's, it's, a different, it's definitely a tool of ins inspiration. And in Khalid's words, he says he, he also liked the fact that his artwork inspired dialogue between groups of folks who would have never communicated or even opened up a discussion about politics. So let's say a lot of his Palestinian pieces would start conversations between Israelis and Palestinians. You know, and then re, re, people would start discussing issues between two groups that probably would have never communicated in the past because of all these false pretenses you know, that guided them. Could you uh, give us a little bit of his background? Um, two aspects I'm more interested in. There was a cartoon about Baltimore, there's a cartoon about Trump. Um, has he been to the United States? Um, does he have a, is he going to see or has he seen the exhibition in Dearborn? And, and the other side is, 
uh, I think you mentioned he was Romanian born. Mm -hmm. um, what's his background? How did he come to cartooning um, and uh, how did he grow up? Okay, good questions. So um, I'll start in the beginning. So his, he was born to, um, to parents who were diplomats. His father was a diplomat in Romania at the time. And so that's why he was born in Romania. Um, and he currently lives in Qatar. And so he, so that's why the Romanian born Sudanese parents uh, living in Qatar. Um, he came to cartoon, to, uh, to, he, became, he came into the world of cartoons, um, again, through his very highly politicized family. And he says that a lot. He was inspired by what he was hearing in his home. Um, and he always loved drawing. So he kind of combined the two loves together. Um, in regards to him visiting the U.S., his first visit was um, to his exhibition at the museum in 2015. This was like around May. So it was his first visit. So he did come to the United States. He also went to D.C. He had a small exhibition there. So that he did visit the United States. In addition to that, he is someone who follows the news, um, global news period. So he is listening and, and watching what's happening in Western media and in, if you want to use the binary, East versus West and in Eastern media. So with the Baltimore image, and that was very um, controversial, even on his page, um, folks were saying, OK, well, you kind of pushed the envelope there. And he's like, yes, that's the point. Um, he was watching and seeing on the, you know, the profound amount of articles and comments and status updates about the up Baltimore uprisings and what was happening. And so he decided. And also, with his background, he knows a little bit about American history. You know, with the whole idea of the KKK, he made that connection. Um, and of course, this isn't the first time we heard it, where you know there's allegations that the KKK has an agenda within the law enforcement. So maybe bl um, fusing these two images together, he came up with this piece. And I think that was really the impetus behind that image. Does that help? Yeah. Um, one of the issues that we, that they're dealing with that we don't deal with as much in the United States is censor censorship. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what do, obviously these cartoons have to be very, not very popular amongst certain regimes. What do they do to try to censor and block this material and what do the artists do to work around that censorship? Oh, so like the example of Ali Farzat, remember the, um, the image with the bullets and the pencils? Yes. I mean, he, and most likely was Assad's regime who um, targeted him and hired thugs to beat him and focus on his hands. He was so severely beaten and wasn't able to draw for months because they focused primarily on his hands. That was a way to censor him. Of course, other ways of censorship are just simple through blocking your Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and social media. Just, you know, you can't access them. So there are ways, and of course, they find ways to circumvent those. That's why Khalid was able to get his work out there. He does often set up, you know, sends a status up and saying, well, someone just tried to block me. Um, and it's from different countries. Um, he's had folks from Syria who tried to, um, and he believes from the Assad regime, who've tried to control the images he um, publishes about Syria. You know, and, and so it's interesting. You, he has it from, and he's living in Qatar. So, you know, you have, of course, have sovereignty issues. Syria can't control Qatar. Um, but they do have elements of that, hackers, mostly. And so, yeah, so they're, they're, they've been able, because cart uh, political cartoonists have been in practice for years in the Arab world, they've never been able to be fully controlled. But of course, there is, you know, the whole idea of being um, um, imprisoned and interrogated. It happens. It happens. And they do, they have a, you know, they take a great risk with their work. I've had several questions from the audience who um, have texted me. And, and so um, a couple of follow-up questions. I think we've been talking a little bit about um, risks, censorship, um, and many of the questions that have come in have, have asked. So what is the status of um, freedom of expression or freedom of speech in um, various countries that um, Albay is, is commenting on? and? Um, is there, um, is his 
uh, living in Qatar, is that a way for him to um, have a greater um, freedom of expression than he would in other countries? Well, he says it. He doesn't draw a lot about Qatar. You know, that's like one of the few countries that is just sort of uh, not, um, not, uh, not even not relevant, but just it doesn't appear in his artwork. And that's, again, indicating that maybe there's censorship issues, that he's not able to, he doesn't have full freedom, but he can talk about any other country from Qatar, just not about Qatar. Um, for instance, I, I'll speak to Sudan, because I know more about that country than any of the others. And um, I mean, he's drawn plenty, and you've seen like the one with um, Bashir and Selva Kerr, and he knows that he's not well liked. He's, he's been rough handled in a sense when he's visited Sudan, um, but because he's not a native of Sudan, I'm not sorry, not native, because he's not a resident of Sudan, they haven't been able to do much with that. So there is, you know, again, he says he goes to Sudan sometimes um, with a fear of not knowing if he's going to come back right away, not in the sense of death, eminent death, but imprisonment. Because his work, he's very anti-Bashir, and his work is all anti-Bashir. And, they f and he's also was part of the very large movement, Girifna, which was trying to create, start an uprising in Sudan to topple the government. So there's also all these political undertones that it's not just what he's drawing, it's also the movement that's supporting that. Hmm. Sorry, it's me again. No, um, by all means. <laughs> I had, a, um, I had a, a, another question. I was interested in um, if you could talk about a, a little bit about the exhibition um, here in Michigan and how that was received. Thank you. Yeah, so um, that was, again, it was very successful. It was, um, we, ha we used to have a, a touring, we have a touring exhibit called Creative Descent. So it wasn't our first time having political protest exhibit at the museum. But his work is extremely timing, uh, timely and thought provoking and resonates again, especially with the diasporic community. Because Dearborn has the highest concentration of Arab Americans in the US. Um, and so, and most of them are from Yemen, Lebanon, and Syria. I'm sorry, Le Lebanon and Yemen and Iraq. So a lot of his artwork talks about the Iraq War, um, not so much about Lebanon, he does have a few pieces out there, um, and a lot about Yemen. So folks were coming to the museum to see what he's saying about their countries and walking away with like, you know, smiles and laughter and also, you know, um, some were offended. Like there are, very, there are a lot of folks who are pro-Bashad who weren't happy with the Mad Men um, image. Um, and so it was well received. It resonated really well with the youth because they were able to see a cool way of utilizing politics and also art. Um, and it doesn't fit the traditional category of art. They think, you know, something on a canvas. So to be able to see c political cartoons and have it welcome in the art world, there were, you know, that was also very inspiring. So it was well received. The community, it, there was a lot of impact in it, again, because of our diasporic community. Okay, I have a couple of questions that are related to how Albe makes his living, what sort of training he has as an artist. Um, and I know you've talked a little bit about, a, about his background, but um, is he able to sustain himself through his artwork? Um, and uh, what sort of training did he have to become the artist that he is? Um, so he works for the Qatari Museum. It's an Islamic museum. I'm, the title of the museum is escaping me, but he's a graphic designer for a museum, a very large, well-known museum in Qatar. And he actually does not profit from this work. He posts it online, you're able to download it. We were um, at the museum, we printed a number of his uh, images and used them as postcards and also prints. And when we asked him, you know, where, when should we send him the check? He's like, I don't profit, send it to a charity. Um, he doesn't m make anything from this artwork and any kind of contribution that's given to him because of his work, he donates it to a charity. So he makes his living working a nine to five job at a museum. So he does have arts background. He's a graphic designer and media illustrator. I can't remember if there was another question with that. I appreciate your coming. Thank, Thank you for you. coming. And when he was talking about Charlie Hebdo, he was kind of in a hurry, talking quite fast. Would you talk a little bit about that? His 
opinion, if I can say that. And I would like to hear what you thought of Charlie Hebdo issue. If you can maybe say something about that too. Or? Yeah. Um, so with Charlie Hebdo, he he um, he actually wrote an editorial piece about that through a Jazeera, um, not only condemning it because as a you know individual who's moral, anyone would. Um, condemn what happened um, in Paris. Um, but he also was talking about um, political freedom, poli freedom of speech, and how it's prized um, in the West, and how that attack was just cowardly, um, despite the fact that he himself did not like the editorial itself, because it was slanting and it was racist and bigoted. So he didn't like that, but he also didn't like the act of, um, of uh, censoring them. He's anti any sort of censorship. So from that element, that's what he was speaking about, um, Charlie Abdu. And of course, because Charlie had a very, um, they were famed for always uh, smearing Muslims and Islam. Um, and so that, of course, from anyone who's practicing Islam and living in the West, you're getting marginalized. Anytime your um, religion or your ethnicity or whatever is being s attacked, you're, you're not going to appreciate that. So he didn't appreciate it on those grounds. Um, but of course, there's no way that he um, supported the attacks, condemned it, and he had a number of art pieces that came out in response to um, Charlie Hebdo. So there was, there was a lot of that. And of course, myself, I stand with him and the rest of the world in condemning as a human being um, with what happened, Charlie, uh, the attacks of Charlie Hebdo, of course. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I'll end with one last question from, um, from the audience. Uh, what do you think, um, through social media, uh, Albe is able to read a, reach a, a Western, Western audience? Um, what, what kind of response um, do you think he hopes to get um, from, say, Americans or Western Europeans? He wants open-mindedness um, to ideas, and he wants dialogue. That's all he hopes to uh, accomplish with his work. He wants folks to feel comfortable enough to start asking questions and really engaging with one another instead of just using media to sort of dictate where you're going in life in terms of your ideas and beliefs about the other. He wants to, um, to dismantle that mind mindset. And so that's what he's hoping to do with these images. Someone might not like the Baltimore image and would say, why? And then through that why, through investigating Khalid and seeing about his background, slowly they'll unveil and see the human aspect behind it, and maybe that could create some sort of empathy. It's all a process of um, you know, creating a dialogic atmosphere and open-mindedness, and that's what he aims to, to, to do with his work. And I think that's, he was able to accomplish that. Um, I mean, I sometimes post some of his images on my Facebook wall if it's something that's really resonating and powerful, and just the, con the conversations that take place, you know, whether it's for or against, it's amazing, and he's simply accomplishing um, what he's aiming to do. It's powerful. Oh, I see. Okay, one more. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, he talks, or he shows many works about uh, political satire. Specifically, what comes to mind is the one uh, of the ISIS attacks on Paris. And you talk about him wanting to unify um, against these regimes and all that. Uh, does he ever focus on uh, the actual unification process, like all the support Paris got after the attack specifically? Um, support from? Just around the world. You, you use social media as an, as an example. Um, all the support, for example, Congress uh, putting up the flag on their colors of the on the building. Do they ever show, or does he do works of support and unity like that? Well, of course, because he's not divisive. I don't want you to walk away thinking that he's a divisive cartoonist. You know, what he's doing is looking at what's happening in the media and how are people responding to it, and he's inspired by that and he creates artwork um, in response. And rarely is it his political opinion. Sometimes whatever is going on in the media, he um, it manifests in, in, in a piece um, of work. And so, it's not always um, full of political undertones um, or his political opinion, um, but rather what the, so what the social media and what the um, online community is feeling. So you can say he's sort of like a um, political anthropologist and also an artist <laughs> and an illustrator, and he's just simply taking what he's seeing and, and putting that into a visual art piece to make sense.
Oh, um, and, oh, thank you. Um, I'll be available upstairs by our table. Um, we have a small exhibition of his work, um, more images than what you've seen here, and then also I'm available for Q&A and more. It, it's by any means. It's a safe space. You can ask me any question. So. All right, before you head out to uh, check out uh, more pieces from uh, Mr. Albay, I just have a couple of housekeeping um, details. Next week, we're discussing another important topic, uh, migration. Our speaker is local expert and good friend of the council, Bing Goy, director for the state of Michigan's Office for New Americans. And he's going to be looking at migration from a local perspective. Um, also, as, as Ms. Uh, El Bashir mentioned, uh, there's more opportunities to engage upstairs in the lobby. Uh, if you're not yet a member of the council, please check it out uh, and sign up for free membership. I want to close with one last statement from Mr. Um, Albay. Uh, this was in reference to the Charlie Hebdo attacks in the Al Jazeera piece that he wrote. Freedom of speech is a powerful weapon and one I've never fully had. But for those who do have it, I wish they would stop taking it for granted. Thank you for coming tonight, and we'll see you next week.